All right, for our last lecture of the semester, we're going to talk about the concept of ecofascism. And so the picture that you see there on the uh, cover slide is one that you probably have seen before. This is Jake Angeli, aka the QAnon shaman, who was one of the more colorful characters uh, from the January 6th insurrection at the US Capitol. Uh, and I used him as the cover photo here because after he was arrested for his participation in that event, he then filed a lawsuit insisting that the jail uh, needed to feed him a diet of strictly organic food, uh, which you know, got a lot of media attention because people found it, you know, kind of funny that someone who is, uh, you know, a big supporter of Donald Trump, who famously, uh, you know, eats Diet Coke and overcooked steaks, uh, would be so insistent on having an all organic diet. Uh, but I think this illustrates some of the connections that can occur between fascism as a form of uh, far right politics and things that we would associate with environmentalism like organic food. So we're going to see how those connections can come together and why it actually kind of makes sense that somebody like uh, the QAnon shaman would be a fan of uh, organic food. So in this lecture, we're going to talk first about what is fascism, right? What do we mean by that term? Then we're going to look at the connections between fascism and the environment and uh, environmentalism. And then we're going to wrap up by talking about the idea of creeping ecofascism or the idea that ecofascist ideas can filter into uh, the way that people who have not adopted the entire ideology of ecofascism think about the environment. So I want to start out by uh, kind of cautioning us away from using this term ecofascism too broadly. Uh, so there's sometimes a tendency to use this term to condemn all environmental regulation that you don't like. Anything that people are doing respect, with respect to the environment that you think is bad, you call it ecofascism because that's you know a good kind of emotive word to attack your enemies with. And this is kind of a manifestation of what's known as Godwin's Law. So Godwin's Law uh, was coined by a guy named Mike Godwin early in the days of internet message boards uh, where he observed that if a discussion goes on long enough, eventually somebody is going to start comparing their opponents to Hitler. Uh, and so this is sort of inevitable that eventually, uh, if your discussion goes on, you start making Hitler and Nazi uh, analogies to your, your enemies. And so, you know, if that's all you're doing, if you're just pulling out the term fascism because that's a you know, really negative thing to call your enemies, then that's not a particularly helpful use of this term. You know, you're getting pretty far afield from what we really want to talk about in this lecture. Uh, and so if you're just talking about, you know, overreach by uh, people trying to, to protect the environment, uh, you could call that, you know, totalitarianism or authoritarianism. Uh, if you're, if it's not really about the specific ideology of fascism. Okay, so, uh, you know, we've got other terms that are, are more, uh, more accurate uh, if you just want to condemn some sort of uh, you know environmental policy or regulation that uh, you don't like. And likewise, we want to make sure to distinguish that not all forms of environmentalism that come from the kind of right side of the political spectrum are themselves forms of specifically eco-fascism. Okay, so eco-fascism is a far right ideology, but not all right wing uh, environmentalism is eco-fascism. So for example, we have uh, the idea of stewardship of the environment that grows out of uh, an interpretation of the book of Genesis uh, in which, you know, humans are sort of uh, charged by God with taking care of the earth, right? That's a form of conservative environmentalism because it's rooted in, you know, a, um, an interpretation of the Bible and so forth, but that's not 
eco-fascism, right? Maybe a, a good or a bad form of environmentalism, but it's not eco-fascism. Uh, and likewise, you have the idea of free market environmentalism. So the idea that if we just, uh, you know, constructed the free market properly and, you know, turned everything into commodities that could be traded in a market system, that that would lead to uh, improvements in the environment. That's another, you know, right wing type of environmentalism growing in this case out of a sort of libertarian uh, philosophy, libertarian in the uh, you know, political libertarian party kind of sense. Uh, and again, that may may or may not be a good form of environmentalism, right? You may or may not agree that the free market can solve all of our environmental problems, but it's definitely not eco-fascism. Right? It's not that specific kind of ideology. So just to make sure we want to use the term eco-fascism in uh, in a careful sense, use it specifically for forms of environmentalism that are tied to a particular uh, far-right ideology. So we can ask, well, what is, you know, what does count as eco-fascism, right? Of all these other things, you know, we shouldn't be using that term for, what things uh, does that uh, apply to? And so at the, the center of fascism as an ideology, or one of the, the core things that distinguishes it from other sorts of ideologies are, out there is the importance of racialized thinking. So sort of at the core is the, an assumption that race is biologically real, right? that there are genuine uh, genetic differences that are like important on a variety of levels between different uh, racial groups of people. And so that you know determines people's personality and uh, behavior, right? So race is biologically real and really matters uh, is kind of at the core of a lot of the elements uh, to fascism. And so then uh, building on that, you get the idea of the intrinsic superiority of certain racial groups and fascism is uh, generally supporting the superiority of those groups that are already dominant in society. So that means we usually see fascism as a white supremacist kind of movement. Uh, if we're looking both, you know, in on the global scale, uh, you know, white uh, people tend to be advantaged uh, politically, economically, culturally, et cetera. And then certainly within places like you know, North America or uh, Europe, right? if you are supporting the superiority of the white race, you're supporting the superiority of the people that are already uh, dominant within your society. But there are uh, ideologies that are related to fascism that you can find in places like India, where it's about the superiority of Hindu people, or in China, where it's about the superiority of the Han, which is the dominant uh, ethnic group uh, within China. Right? But in any any of these cases, it's about supporting the group that's already dominant uh, in your society. And then connected to that is the fear of being replaced or overwhelmed by people of other races. The people of other races are going to take over, that they are going to somehow destroy uh, what's good about this dominant racial group, that there's going to be you know, too many of them coming in from somewhere else, or they're going to breed too rapidly within uh, the society. Uh, and so that idea of being replaced or overwhelmed by some other race uh, of people drives this idea that there's a, a threat that needs to be responded to by taking action against those uh, people that you uh, fear. And if race is biologically real like this, then you easily get to the idea of eugenics. So eugenics is the idea that you can improve the race or improve the whole human species through selective breeding through encouraging the right people with the superior genes to uh, you know, produce children together and preventing people that are seen as having inferior genes from reproducing. So this idea of eugenics uh, gets caught up in, uh, in fascist ideologies. And we should also note that uh, a lot of times people will sort of try to, to hide the racial dimension or excuse the racial dimension to uh, a fascist way of thinking by labeling it as being about culture rather than about race. Uh, with the idea that, you know, well, fascism is about race. Well, I'm not really talking about race. I'm talking about culture here. Uh, but 
and a lot of times this is sort of a, a really transparent, uh, you know, attempt to just put a euphemism on it uh, because, you know, it's clear what set of people you uh, assume to have a certain culture. And so the, the racial dimension is still in there, even if you are putting this kind of veneer of, oh, we're just talking about culture uh, on top of it to avoid censure from people who would condemn you for being racist. When we look at the political approach of uh, fascism, we see uh, a lot of it is rooted in an idealization of power and strength, both at the individual level, right, the idea of praising individuals who are uh, strong and powerful, both sort of physically strong uh, and also kind of strong in their like personality right, and uh, their ability to you know impose their will on the world around them. Uh, and then you also get this idea of power and strength at the sort of national level, right? That the, the nation should be strong and able to uh, able to exert its will over the world around it. Um, and so then the flip side of that is then you condemn those that you see as uh, weak. Uh, and so that's both, you know, condemning people after you uh, perceive them as weak and also calling people weak as a way of condemning them. So there's really uh, this really strong emphasis on the importance of power and strength. And then a willingness to sacrifice those that you see as weak or lower value for this larger cause, right? The strong will survive. We have to sort of cut loose those who are weak and therefore uh, inferior. And so this leads pretty naturally into an authoritarian political approach, the idea of this strong rule by a leader who can get his way and make things happen and not have to worry about, you know, compromising and working with other people and all this kind of stuff. Um, you have this sort of authoritarian uh, politics imposing its will on people, though it's often rationalized as representing and, and serving the true will or interests of the people, or at least the people who matter, right? The, the right kind of people uh, who the authoritarian is ruling on, uh, on behalf of. So you get this, you know, rhetoric of supporting the people and the sort of populist support for it, uh, but the, the mechanism of uh, government is authoritarian. And then that's connected, of course, to willingness to use violence. So willingness to use violence both to establish uh, a, a fascist system and then to perpetuate that system once it gains power. So if we have this idea of strength and competition and needing to sacrifice those who are weaker, this has correspondences with ideas about resources and resource scarcity. And so this is where we start to see why a, uh, a fascist uh, way of thinking about the world starts to draw in elements that we might associate with environmentalism. So we have, uh, you know, if we have these different racial groups and they're sort of in this inherent conflict with each other, one of the things they're going to be in conflict about is competition over limited resources. There's only so much uh, of various resources to go around. And so therefore, you know, the, the superior race needs to uh, capture uh, those resources for themselves, right? The people who really matter need to get those resources and need to cut off the people who are uh, inferior but trying to use them up. Uh, and so one of the, the ways that this gets expressed is the idea of blood and soil, which is a, a phrase that was uh, used by the, the Nazis in Germany to describe the idea that there's uh, an intrinsic tie between certain, a racial group and its homeland. So, uh, you know, a certain land belongs to a certain people and anybody else that's living there is, you know, an outsider, an intruder of some sort. They don't belong. They're not the right people for uh, this land. So you can condemn, you know, for foreigners and immigrants and so forth as not belonging to uh, this place. And so this is, you know, one of the ways in which uh, the anti-Semitism that you see in uh, most fascism develops, uh, because there's this perception that Jews as a people are sort of rootless, that they don't, you know, have a connection to that land. And so therefore, if, uh, you know, if you're putting this, you know, really high priority on the interests of the, the people who belong to that piece of land, then you're going to 
take issue with people that you see as not having those kinds of, of roots. And then this this group, right, this nation or race uh, is seen as a kind of super organism, right? It's a sort of a, an entity uh, that has its own need for growth. And so for that growth, it's going to need to absorb additional resources. Going along with this, uh, people who are already poor and marginalized, right, because fascism is about defending the interests of those that are already socially dominant and uh, in power, those who are, are poor and marginalized get blamed for environmental degradation, and then that becomes a justification for eliminating them or taking those resources away from them, because clearly they're wasting and misusing those resources, and so they can't be uh, trusted with them. So uh, ultimately, this can lead to an idea that we need to destroy these inferior groups of people so that these superior ones can flourish to free up this uh, limited land and resources for the people that really need it, the people that it uh, you know, really should belong to. And uh, this can manifest as a strong anti-immigration stance. So if the, this land belongs to a particular uh, racialized idea of a nation, then people who don't already belong here, if they're trying to come in, they're just going to come in and use up our resources. Uh, and so therefore, we need to keep those people out in order to maintain these resources for the people that they truly belong to. And uh, a really clear expression of this came with the fight over the uh, leadership of the Sierra Club that happened in the early 2000s that you read a bit about in your uh, case study readings for this week, that there was this attempt essentially to take over the Sierra Club by creating this connection uh, this connection over the question of resources between these far-right anti-immigration uh, groups and the Sierra Club, a major environmental group. So there is this slate of candidates for the leadership of the Sierra Club that pushed the idea that uh, the Sierra Club ought to adopt as a major agenda item restrictions on immigration. So the immigrants didn't come in and use up the limited resources of the United States. And of course, those immigrants were people that would be typically of a different race than uh, the people already in the United States, right? We've got a, uh, a country that is uh, dominated by uh, white non-Hispanic people and the major uh, immigrants that were coming to the United States uh, at that time, as in uh, today, are coming from uh, Latin America, right? So they're uh, Hispanic, often uh, of black or indigenous descent, uh, and so uh, the, these groups were trying to uh, enlist the resources of the Sierra Club uh, in promoting this anti-immigration agenda by tying it to this environmental concern over resource uh, overuse. And so, you know, luckily, as you saw in those readings, uh, the this was an unsuccessful campaign and a, uh, a leadership group was uh, elected that um, was not friendly to this immigration restrictionist uh, kind of uh, thinking. Another way that you get connections between fascism and environmentalism is the idea of purity. So if you have this racialized thinking, there's a lot of emphasis on the importance of racial purity, right? that we want to keep out the influence of these lesser races. We don't want them uh, you know, their influence on society. We don't want their genes coming into the gene pool. So this idea of purification of the, the race or the nation, and that ties very easily into the idea of purity of the environment, of eliminating pollution and contamination within nature as well. So this tends to draw on this romanticized idea of a rural past where things were, you know, pure and healthy and without all of the uh, contamination caused by modern industrial society. <clears throat> 
one way that this manifests, and here's where uh, we get the connection to the QAnon shaman that we talked about back at the beginning, is the idea of vegetarian or organic diets. So one of the rationales that people have for adopting these kind of diets is an idea of purity, that you're going to uh, protect the health of your body by eating this diet that is in some ways more, more pure, more clean than uh, a standard diet. And so this concern for purity has led a lot of people within fascist kinds of movements to adopt these kinds of vegetarian or organic diets. And so famously, Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian. You know, he stopped eating meat because he saw that as, you know, an impurity that he was trying to avoid in his life, just like he was trying to eliminate the supposed impurity of various uh, groups within uh Germany, you know, Jews and uh, Romani people and, you know, various other uh, groups that they were trying to eliminate. So there's this, you know, shared uh, conception of uh, purity. And beyond Hitler's personal um, practices, you know, the Nazi party, while it was in charge in Germany, adopted a variety of strong animal welfare laws, stronger than most other countries had had uh, at the time. And that included banning of kosher butchering practices, which you remember I Reference that in an earlier, um, earlier lesson, right? So that you know the uh, the connection between the idea of you know purity of the food system and anti-Semitism by condemning uh, Jewish butchering pra practices as you know improper and, and bad for the the animals in there, uh, and so you know I should be clear here, right? The point is not that all vegetarianism or all organic diets are themselves forms of fascism, right? There are lots of reasons that someone might adopt, say, a vegetarian diet. I myself am, am vegan, uh, and I don't think that I have fascist reasons for that. Um, but there are certain uh, rationales for vegetarianism that end up appealing a lot to uh, people coming from a fascist point of view. You also get uh, comparisons between people of color, you know, the, the racial groups that are being uh, disdained here, comparing them to pollution or invasive species. So the rhetoric against uh, people of races that are, are being uh, oppressed gets, you know, sounds very similar to the rhetoric against pollution, you know, the need to clean up uh, environmental pollution and the need to get rid of uh, invasive species that you know, don't belong in this environment that are disrupting the purity of the ecosystem in the same way that you know, people of color are uh, described by fascists as disrupting the purity of the nation. And there will sometimes be specific uh, connections drawn if there's a you know a, a particularly notable invasive species that happens to come from the same place that uh, a certain say immigrant group that uh, is kind of being emphasized as bad uh, might come from. And so you get this uh, also this nostalgia for this mythical pure past. So a past that is held up to be pure both in environmental terms as not having you know pollution and invasive species and all these things, and also is believed to be racially pure. So there's a, a perception among people coming from a kind of fascist point of view that in the past uh, there was racial purity, that different races lived in their own areas and didn't uh, intermingle with each other. So, you know, if you go back, uh, you know, a millennia or two, you'll find this sort of pure white race in Europe uh, without intermixture from all these other groups that, uh, you know, live in Europe today. And I call that on this slide mythical because there never was a point at which we had this kind of racial purity anywhere in the world. You know, you go back to the Middle Ages, for example, there are lots of people all over Europe who come from other parts of the world. You know, there were lots of Arabs, lots of North Africans and even Sub-Saharan African people uh, and lots of Asians that uh, were living in, working, traveling, trading uh, in in Europe. You know, if you look at, for example, the uh, the stories about King Arthur, they were written in the, in the high middle ages and you know you look at the lists of knights at the round table there are a number of knights who are middle eastern uh people and uh depending on which uh versions of the story you read were in fact black people um because there you know there it wasn't a 
uh, pure white land, there were people from all over uh, coming in there. You know, if you look at art from the ancient and uh, medieval period, you see lots of depictions of people who are not uh, white being part of European society. But within uh, fascist thinking, there's this this mythic ideal of racial purity in the past. And so people will adopt the kind of aesthetic associated with these eras as a way of trying to connect to this ideal of purity. So these, depending on, you know, who you are, you know, this might be a, a Viking kind of thing. Uh, you know, you saw like the horns on uh, the QAnon shaman guys, uh, headdress there, you know, kind of a Viking style to them. It might be Roman in some cases, you know, Rome is often popular because of the connection to that ideal of strength, right? Rome was this massive, very powerful empire that dominated all the uh, countries around it. So there's a lot of interest in uh, that that Roman ideal or just medieval European aesthetics uh, in general. And Again, that doesn't mean that everybody that thinks that, you know, Viking or Roman aesthetics are cool uh, is a fascist, right? You know, there's lots of people who are, um, you know, into these kind of things and very much not, uh, you know, supportive of any of these elements of fascism. And this actually becomes a, uh, a conflict within uh, groups like uh, historical reenactor groups uh, or among people who practice uh, European paganism. Right? So there are people who practice essentially Viking religion uh, that have you know, brought that into the, the modern era and, you know, of course, use a lot of those sorts of things. You know, they use runes in their uh, uh, rituals and so forth, uh, and they have to contend with, uh, you know, fascists trying to join their groups because they're they're interested in that same uh, elements of history, but want to use it in uh, a different way. And so there's a lot of conflicts within uh, things like Norse pagan uh groups about trying to keep out the fascist influence and trying to establish that you can be a Norse pagan without being uh, a fascist uh, because people might sometimes you know distrust you if you, they see you have like you know a rune tattoo or something uh, they might assume that you're one of the the fascists who are interested in uh, those kinds of things and then this idea of purity also ends up uh, connecting to very strict attitudes towards sex because sex uh, is often thought of as in some way dirty or contaminating. And so a lot of fascist groups put a lot of strict regulations on sex so that people aren't in some way contaminated by sexual activity. And so this can manifest in homophobia and you know, view that uh, homosexual sex is particularly dirty or uh, contaminating. It can manifest as transphobia because people, you know, crossing strict gender boundaries is seen as a form of pollution or contamination. Uh, and it can even manifest as an anti-masturbation ideology. So drawing on the idea that you know, masturbation is a, a form of self-pollution. Uh, and so a lot of fascist groups will condemn that uh, as something, you know, inappropriate and impure for people to engage in. So another area that we see connections between uh, fascist thinking and environmentalism comes with the neo-Malthusian uh, line of thought. So Neo-Malthusianism is a modern day revival of the ideas of Thomas Malthus, who you may have heard of in other uh, environmental classes that you've taken. He was sort of the first person to put forward a really strong statement about the danger of overpopulation. So he made some calculations based on the growth of the white settler population in uh, British colonies in the Americas in the 1700s. He looked at how quickly uh, their population numbers were growing in an area where they had seemingly unlimited land because they were rapidly, you know, taking that land away from the indigenous people. Um, so they had lots of land to spare for themselves. Uh, and he, based on his calculations there, he 
uh, he wrote this essay saying that the human population will just expand continuously until we literally run out of resources and people start starving. That's the only thing that's going to rein in uh, population. So there's a sort of inevitable overpopulation and resource scarcity. So Neo-Malthusian revives this concern of you know populations just exploding and destroying all of our uh, resources. You know, Malthus was focused specifically just on food resources. Neo-Malthusianisms look at kind of the, the full range of environmental resources that uh, we might depend on. And it's perhaps not surprising that, uh, you know, a far-right ideology like fascism would be interested in Malthusian thinking because Malthus himself uh, used his ideas of overpopulation to support a uh, right-wing political agenda. So he argued on this basis that aid to the poor was useless. That if we were to, you know, England had some very rudimentary welfare policies called the Corn Laws that would provide some uh, food. This was organized through uh, churches, uh, you know, the state church, the, the Church of England. Um, it would provide some food to the very poor and destitute. And Malthus argued against doing that because he said, hey, if you feed the poor, they're just going to have a bunch of babies and then you're going to need to feed those babies and eventually we're going to run out of food anyway. So you might as let's just cut them off, right? Let's just let uh, the poor starve because feeding them is not actually going to accomplish anything because they're just going to breed out of control. Uh, so this way of thinking uh, becomes very appealing to people coming from a, a fascist point of view. Uh, so in Malthus's case, he just wanted to kind of cut off the poor from uh, active support and let them fend for themselves. Uh, but some Neo-Malthusians uh, feel like the crisis uh, with resource scarcity today and overpopulation is just too dire to be left to democratic and voluntary means to get the population under control and, and ensure that we have enough resources, that instead we need an authoritarian government uh, that can implement policies that will accomplish rapid and drastic redu reductions in population, that we need, you know, heavy restrictions on who can have how many children. And in practice, this has very often meant targeting people who are marginalized, uh, both economically marginalizing the poor, uh, and also racially marginalized, both within countries and internationally, as being the people who the, uh, the emphasis of uh, population restriction will fall on. So there's been lots of programs of involuntary sterilization used, for example, against indigenous women in places like the United States, Canada, Australia, that, you know, they would go in for, uh, to the health clinic for some sort of other checkup. And while they were there, the people in charge would decide, oh, she's too irresponsible to be having more children. So we're just going to, you know, tie her tubes uh, without asking for consent. Uh, this is also done against black women in the United States. They're forced sterilization or involuntary uh, sterilizations. There are programs that have targeted women in India. So these are programs sponsored by uh, you know, organizations coming out of you know, the United States and, and Europe, but then they're going over to India and again, forcibly uh, or you know, through uh, fraud, uh, doing sterilizations to Indian women because they are seen as liable to reproduce uh, too rapidly. Uh, and so you get this kind of idea of, you know, people of certain races being viewed as lesser and therefore similar to animals that will breed out of control and have way too many kids. And so they need to be have their fertility reined in lest we overpopulate uh, the world. So that's a, uh, a Malthusian adoption of this overpopulation concern that we often associate with uh, environmentalism. And so the kind of an, an overarching uh, philosophy behind this is what's called lifeboat ethics. And so this was uh, a term coined by Garrett Hardin, who you may have heard as the guy that also coined the term the tragedy of the commons. And so if you're familiar with the idea of the tragedy of the commons and this kind of uh, parable that uh, Hardin told about these uh, sheep herders who keep increasing the number of sheep because it's a shared pasture and no one person is responsible for maintaining the, the sustainability of the pasture until they destroy the whole thing and they all, you know, all the sheep die. Uh, it's the same guy. And so he wrote this other essay called Lifeboat Ethics, uh, where he used the metaphor of a lifeboat, right? If you've got a sinking ship and you're on the 
this lifeboat, that lifeboat can only hold so many people. And so if you try to get all of the people from the ship onto the same lifeboat, you know, I guess your other lifeboats have been destroyed, or maybe you're like the Titanic and you didn't have enough lifeboats in the first place because you were overconfident about the unsinkability of the main ship. Uh, for whatever reason, right? If you try to pull too many people onto the lifeboat, the lifeboat's going to sink and everybody's going to die. So you have to reject some people. You have to leave them in the water to die so that the people already in the lifeboat can uh, survive. And so Hardin applied this as a metaphor for uh, population and resources at the global scale. He said, look, there's got too many people. If we try to support everybody, we're all gonna run out of resources. So we need to just let some people die. And of course the people that he was going to just let die so that the people, uh, so that others could live were people in uh, poorer regions of the world, people in places like Africa, where he's basically said, uh, we can't support those people. We need to just let them uh, fend for themselves and die if they can't make it so that they don't drag down those of us in the rich countries who are already in our uh, lifeboat. And so that type of thinking is really appealing from a fascist point of view, right? that we're going to protect the people that we actually care about that are already in the lifeboat. And, uh, you know, we just can't help anybody else and we have to just uh, let them let them die or let them uh, at best fend for themselves uh, in a situation of extreme resource scarcity and, you know, keep our resource to ourselves uh, in our lifeboat here. So I mentioned earlier that uh, fascism tends to be very friendly towards violence as a political strategy. And so this leads us to the topic of eco-terrorism. So terrorism conducted for uh, environmental goals. So terrorism uh, in general is acts of violence intended to evoke disproportionate fear in the service of some sort of political agenda. So you, you know, kill some people and that creates this level of fear that ripples out much farther than just the, you know, the strict uh, number of people that actually got uh, killed. And the goal of that fear is to advance some sort of political agenda. Uh, to extract some sort of concessions from uh, a government that you dislike or something like that. And so that, that's uh, the essence of terrorism is acts of violence that are meant to provoke this much greater fear among the, the set of people uh, who are attacked. Uh, and so, as I said, eco-terrorism is when you apply terrorism for environmental ends. And eco-terrorism uh, is a real thing. It's a thing that a number of groups engage in. Uh, although we want to keep in mind that laws against eco-terrorism, laws meaning to uh, combat eco-terrorism and punish eco-terrorists, uh, are often applied over broadly and kind of used as a way of condemning all kinds of you know, non-terrorist uh, environmental protest and activism as well. So, you know, we want to be able to both remember that eco-terrorism is a real thing and, uh, you know, be careful of anti-eco-terrorist measures that, uh, that go too broadly and uh, condemn too much uh, uh, political activity that ought to be uh, acceptable. So some eco-terrorism uh, is meant to attack property rather than people, or at least that is the uh, justification that's given, right? That's the rationale and the, the you know, the, the stated agenda of some groups is to attack property, but not people. And so you see that from groups like the Earth Liberation Front or the Sea Shepherd uh, Conservation Society, uh, who are the, the people that go out and attack uh, whaling ships. Uh, these groups, you know, if you uh, look at what they say about their activities, will, uh, you know, insist very strongly that their goal is to destroy property in order to protect uh, the environment, uh, but not uh, to harm people. So for example, some groups will engage in tree spiking, which is where you put uh, big metal spikes into trees that are planned to be logged. And if a tree has been spiked, then it becomes incredibly dangerous to try to cut it down. Because if you're a you know, logger, you go out there with your chainsaw and your chainsaw hits one of these spikes, uh, it can kick back and, uh, you know, potentially hit you and do a lot of damage and even possibly kill you. So that's, you know, very dangerous to people. But when a group engages in tree spiking, usually what they do is they put the spikes out and then they... 
make sure to tell everybody that these trees have been spiked because the goal is to frighten the loggers into not cutting them. And so then loggers don't get hurt, but then also the trees don't get cut down. Right? That's, that's the sort of goal is we're going to, you know, do some damage to these trees, but it will protect the, the forest. And, uh, you know, if people are smart, they won't go out and try to cut those trees. So they won't get hurt, right? Or you might uh, disable uh, construction equipment, you know, take some bolts out of some things so the construction equipment can't run. Um, and so the, the property has been damaged, but uh, people are not directly uh, threatened. So, you know, you can argue about how well that distinction is maintained in practice by specific groups, but at least that's the, the rhetoric is that it's an attack on property rather than people. But there are uh, individuals and groups that do in fact attack people directly as a, uh, a you know a primary form of eco-terrorist activity. And we see this with a number of uh, shooters and bombers that have advanced an explicitly eco-fascist agenda. So uh, I've got three examples to talk about uh, of explicitly eco-fascist violence. So the first example is uh, a guy called Ted Kaczynski, who is known as the Unabomber. Uh, and so that actually comes from the, the acronym for the uh, FBI, uh, the FBI mission to track him down and find him because he operated actually over quite a long period of time from 1978 up until 1995 uh, and uh, he uh, did bombings that ended up killing uh, three people and injuring 23 uh, others and so he practiced a, a primitivist lifestyle he lived in the woods tried to be you know sustainable low environmental impact and he put out a manifesto that criticized the environmental degradation that was being caused by uh, modern society so he had this kind of environmentalist uh, rationale that he stated for engaging in this violence and for you know attacking people that he saw as being uh, potentially related to uh, this uh, these things that he thought were problems in society and therefore trying to frighten people into giving up on uh, giving up on the kinds of environmental harms that uh, he was against. In 2019, you had a shooter in the city of Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, who killed 52 people at two mosques. So he was specifically targeting mosques, which are you know, predominantly uh, attended by immigrants uh, or you know, descendants of recent immigrants in uh, New Zealand. Right, people practicing Islam, and he put out a manifesto about why he. Uh, conducted this shooting uh, that said, among other things, quote, the environment is being destroyed by overpopulation. We Europeans are one of the groups that are not overpopulating the world. The invaders are the ones overpopulating the world. Kill the invaders, kill the overpopulation, and by doing so, save the environment. So this is a very explicit eco-fascist kind of ideology right? that he says we've got environmental degradation. It's being caused by overpopulation. And there are particular uh, races of people who are responsible for this overpopulation. Right? He says that uh, we Europeans are not causing uh, overpopulation, right? that the, the white population isn't growing uh, rapidly, but the population of people from, you know, places like the Middle East or Africa, which is where, you know, most of the people at these mosques would have uh, you know, been descended from, those are the people responsible for overpopulation. And so we need to kill them. They're invaders, right? They don't belong here. Um, you can see how this pulls together a lot of these uh, ideas that we've been uh, seeing as characteristic of ecofascism. Uh, and then directly inspired by the Christchurch shooter, excuse me, we have later the same year, we have a shooter in El Paso, Texas and killed 23 people. Uh, and so his manifesto, you know, really echoed a lot of the themes in the Christchurch shooters manifesto. Uh, and so, you know, I've got the quote there from him, if we can get rid of enough people, then our way of life can become more sustainable. So the same idea that we need to violently reduce the population that, and we should you know, target certain groups of people as being responsible for this overpopulation. And um, you know, that's the only solution that, that uh, is viable for this environmental crisis. So I want to wrap up by talking about this idea that I, I called in the, the introduction, creeping ecofascism. So this is the idea that 
you don't have to have adopted the entire fascist ideology. You might, in fact, find the, the fascist ideology as a whole repugnant, but that doesn't mean that you might not fall into certain uh, specific lines of thought that are consistent with ecofascism. Uh, so you can get, you know, little bits and pieces of ecofascist thinking creeping into uh, discourse among people who would not endorse the ideology wholesale. And so, you know, it's important to uh, keep this in mind because, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, dedicated ecofascists like, you know, the Christchurch shooter or the QAnon shaman or something like that, you get ecofascist ideas being propagated by people uh, who wouldn't think of themselves as being ecofascist in any way. And so as an example, I'm drawing on the we are the virus meme that went around uh, in the past year during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. So, oh, forgot to put the first bullet point up there as I explained it. Rhetoric with ecofascist implications can slip into non-fascist uh, discourse, right? So the, the people that are spreading this, this meme around are not ecofascist, but they're spreading an idea that is consistent with ecofascism. So, you know, uh, this all started with this tweet you see there by uh, Thomas Schultz, where he says, coronavirus is the Earth's vaccine, we're the virus, uh, in response to some of the environmental improvements that we saw during the this initial phase of really strong lockdown when, you know, a lot fewer people were out driving uh, and, you know, putting pollution into the air and stuff like that. We actually saw air quality improve. There were a number of uh, a number of stories that turned out not to be true, but got very popular on social media uh, about, you know, wild animals returning to uh, places where the water and air quality had improved uh, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, the implication that's drawn from this by Thomas Schultz is that humans are the virus, right? Humans are this uh, harmful sort of invasive species in the whole world and that the coronavirus by killing off uh, people is somehow healing uh, the earth. Uh, and then the, the second uh, image I've got there is a sort of, you know, a joke riffing on this. And that's a lot of how this spread was people making uh, jokes about this. Uh, all right. So there you see a, a cake returning to the ocean uh, in that picture that is, you know, jokingly presented as uh, evidence that nature is healing and humans are the virus for keeping our cakes out of the ocean. Um, so a lot of it was just, you know, getting joked about, but there were people who saw some merit in that way of thinking, right? There were people who thought, well, maybe coronavirus kind of is a uh, a vaccine for the earth against the virus presented by uh, people. And so if you follow this line of thinking to its conclusion, right, that coronavirus is doing something good for the earth by uh, killing people and limiting our uh, our activities, that gets you really easily into these lines of thinking that, you know, we need this extreme and violent uh, means of reducing human population to uh, prevent resource overuse. And that this ends up getting targeted towards people who are already vulnerable groups within society, right? So remember, uh, fascism kind of at its core is about supporting the interests of the groups that are already dominant in society. So if you think about, you know, who is it who uh, is suffering the most from coronavirus, right? Who are the people uh, who are the first to get killed off by this disease and that, uh, you know, their deaths are essentially being endorsed if you view the coronavirus as the Earth's vaccine, right? It's people who are already marginalized in society. It's people who are disabled, people who have health complications, people who are old. Uh, communities of color saw much higher uh, rates of coronavirus and much higher rates of death from infections, right? So especially black communities uh, and indigenous communities saw were hit much worse by uh, coronavirus than uh, the white population. So those are the people who are being sacrificed uh, to, uh, you know, reduce the human population if the coronavirus is being seen as doing something positive for the environment. And so that slides pretty nicely into that fascist way of thinking that certain groups of people uh, should be sacrificed. Certain groups of people are, are weak and need to go in order to uh, 
preserve the world for the strong and dominant in society. So I'll leave you with that sort of uh, caution to be careful about eco-fascist uh, ideas creeping into discourse and thinking that is not, you know, at its root necessarily uh, eco-fascist. So we will talk about this some more in our live class.